have something really good, a hot topic in the news this week. been charged with crime. This is a show where I try to educate Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. I have in the audience, or my guest tonight, I'm sorry, is Sam Millage. He was here last week, and we talked about an aggravated robbery trial that we had. I feel that's a very important topic, and so we're going to continue what happened in the trial, uh, because I think it's a good educational tool, and hopefully when I put it on YouTube, young people will watch it and learn from it and hopefully be deterred from uh, committing these type of crimes. But let's talk about what goes on in the criminal justice system. I'm going to ask Sam to first give us a recap of what we talked about last week, which is how his client got charged, what the facts were according to the police, how his client got associated with being the person who uh, was accused of robbery, and also assault on a peace officer, because I believe it was really assault on a peace officer. and just all the facts that continued because it's an interesting case study. So Sam, let's get started. Yes ma'am, well first of all thank you for having me once again, I appreciate it. Uh, just briefly, like we talked about last week, the original charge and the main charge that my client was first uh, charged with was aggravated assault on a police officer. Uh, as we talked about, there was no aggravated robbery until six months later after we, meaning myself and my client, did not want to plea to uh, anything that the uh, state was offering at that particular time. So... Remind us about what the facts were that led to the aggravated assault on a peace officer. Well, the facts were this. Sometime in December, I, I want to say December 31st, 2011, somewhere around there, uh, an off-duty police officer for HPD was at a uh, Boudreaux's off 249 enjoying, um, I guess, a late lunch with a female acquaintance. Uh, as they were exiting the restaurant, they walked out, and according to the police officer, he noticed a black male, uh, and I'm going to give the air quotes there, a black male uh, going through his trunk of the car that he was driving that particular day. Now, again, he was off-duty police officer. The particular car that he was driving was a plain Dodge Charger that you and I see drive up and down every day. Uh, there was nothing about anything that said Houston Police Department. And in fact, he was not on duty at the he time. He was not on duty at that time. I believe he was, uh, like I said, eating lunch and they had just come from watching his daughter's basketball game or something to that uh, effect. Well, as he sees this black male rummaging through his trunk, uh, he, I guess, takes out a identification badge that HPD wears. And, and most people, when they think of identification badges for HPD, you know, we watch TV and everybody sees that little gold shield. Well, no, they have like a little swipe card, it looks like to me, that they put around their neck. And if you don't know any better, you're not close enough, you're not going to be able to tell that it's HPD. Uh, but he allegedly puts this on around his neck. He runs towards the car. And at this time, when he says police, apparently whoever the guy was that was rummaging through the trunk jumps into a car that's parked right next to his. All right, and... Does he drive, jump into the passenger or driver's seat? He, uh, according to the police officer, he jumps into the driver's seat, okay? And the police officer is able to get there, I guess, hold him at bay for approximately two seconds. According to the police officer, through dark tint, he's able to see the guy put his hands up as if he's complying, and then all of a sudden drop his hands out of his line of sight. And, of course, the police officer used the good company line of he was in fear of his life, and he thought he saw what appeared to be a gun. The car drives off in an attempt to try to get out of the way, or shall I say, just to leave the premises. Uh, the officer says that the, the car tried to run him over, although he was on the side of the car as opposed to being in front of the car. And at that time, the officer lets off four or five shots. The car gets away, gets on the feeder road of 249, hits another car because they were driving the wrong way on the feeder road. They're out of sight. So for two or three days after that, 
we get three different descriptions of this getaway car. We get a brown color, we get a, a black color, we get a gray color. Uh, the news media is reporting it all wrong. The news media is reporting a black car. Uh, the news media, I think it was Channel 2 that was doing it, and then Channel 11 picks it up and says that no, it's a gray car. Then it just turned into a dark color car. So they didn't know that. And at this point in time, there was no license plate. There was no description of the suspect. The only description that was given was just a black male. Uh, apparently, there was an anonymous tip given to Crime Stoppers naming uh, my particular client and another young man. And off of this tip, somehow they were, you know, they generated a photo array. And this officer, after only saying a black male, is able to ID my client as the particular person that he saw outside uh, rummaging through his trunk. And so that's how my client uh, gets named. They get a warrant. They go arrest him at his mom's house. And here I get a call saying, hey, this is what's going on. Could you represent my son? And of course, I say yes. And immediately I saw some holes in the case, with the first thing being just a black male was the description. And if you saw my client, the first thing that jumps out is he has a bunch of tattoos, visible tattoos, tattoos all over his face. I mean, every from head to toe, he has tattoos. And that was the first thing that jumped out at me. And I was, as I waited on the offense report, and I think I mentioned this last week, it took almost three or four months to get an offense report. By the time we got the offense report, we had moved from the, particular, from the original courtroom we were in to the new courtroom and Judge Denise Bradley's courtroom. At that point in time, I, I get the offense report. I'm able to go through the offense report. It's over 100 pages. And the three statements that this police officer gives, the only description that he gives of the person that he allegedly saw was just a black male. We don't even get um, clothing description. We don't get anything like that. We just have a black male. So my guy gets ID'd. And, uh, and needless to say, my guy had been on their radar for some time. Apparently, he was alleged to have been involved in some type of uh, vehicular, you know, burglary uh, ring or something, but they never caught him on anything like that. So, you know, without having a license plate, without having an accurate description of the car, with only having a description of a black male, again, my guy is the person that they choose. And our first offer, and I think we talked about this last week, first offer that the state gave us on uh, aggravated uh, assault against police officers was just 20 years off the bat. And of course, I said no after offer, asking my client, did he find that to be acceptable? And at that point, I think the uh, DA was a little frustrated at the fact that I was not willing to play ball with him and just go along to get along. Um, so then, you know, he was seeking to add a new charge of aggravated robbery, like we talked about. And he was successful in doing that. Six months after the fact, he was able to get that aggravated robbery charge, uh, despite nothing ever being mentioned of anything being taken by any of the witnesses that were out there, uh, despite not having an accurate description of the, uh, the suspect, he was able to get it in, indicted, which, as they say in Harris County, a ham sandwich can get indicted. It's not very difficult. Um, so it was a little disappointing with that, and as a result of that, there was a new bond placed on my client's head uh, of $50,000. Unfortunately, uh, which in, in, in my opinion was a bad mistake, he decided to go on the run. Um, and of course, I advised against that. I did not know where he was. Um, I, I didn't know. I just told him I didn't think that was a good decision. You might want to turn yourself in if you know you're not going to be able to make this bond because you're only going to make your life more difficult. And uh, as fate would have it, he was picked up. Uh, he was picked up, uh, unfortunately alleged to have been committing another crime, uh, which I, I expect to get to today. We'll talk about that a little bit today. But uh, at that point in time, the, the wheels started moving real fast, and we were able to go to trial at the beginning, I'm sorry, at the end of January. And it was a hard-fought trial, and 95% of the state's case was focused on the aggravated assault against a public servant. All their witnesses, uh, all the, the evidence that they, they put forth, 95% of it was based on the aggravated assault against a public servant. Uh, it was a very difficult trial in that not only was there tons and tons of evidence that the state uh, produced, some of it I thought was very cumulative and repetitive, uh, despite my objection, um, that evidence was still allowed in. And as I quickly learned in this particular courtroom in the 262nd, uh, <laughs> the, 
a lot of objections that you made were going to be overruled, unfortunately. And I know we, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but it was a very... You can talk about it now. Okay, well, the particular... Let's talk about why the trial was difficult uh, in the 260... Which... 262nd. Okay. Um, it wasn't that it was a very difficult case. I felt like this was a case where the evidence was heavily in our favor, or the lack of evidence was heavily in our favor. But what made it difficult was the particular neutral party that was supposed to act as a referee seemed to be a little bit more biased towards the state side. And I, I know a lot of defense attorneys will say, well, the judge is biased. And, you know, most judges, despite in Harris County, we see a lot of judges that are former prosecutors, most judges can, can be impartial, like they're supposed to be, like they take their oath to be. But there were some things that it just, it just seemed like it was not even. Uh, we had a lot of arguments that were very good, supported by case law, whereas the other side was just objecting, didn't have any case law to support it, and, and sometimes the judge would sustain the objection without even hearing the argument. It got to the point where I would have to ask the judge, would judge at least allow them to expound on uh, their reasoning for making this objection, or she would overrule me before I would make my objection. And I would say, well, judge, you know, again, with all due respect, allow me to... Uh, allow me to expound on why I feel this objection should be sustained as opposed to overruled. And, of course, because this was on the record, she would say I apologize and allow me to explain uh, the, the ruling behind my objection or, or the reasoning behind my objection, and it still would get overruled. And what I learned quickly, sometimes you don't object for purposes of trial. As my dad was saying, and my dad was trying this case with me, you object for purposes of the appeal, to build a record. And in that particular courtroom, that was profound wisdom, because it got to the point I knew things were going to get overruled before I even objected, but to build a record, because I knew the objection or the overruling of the objection would be wrong, and hopefully our Court of Appeals uh, would see otherwise and overturn it. But uh, it was difficult in that sense because not only am I fighting the state in the states, tons and tons, I think they may have had something 10 to 13 witnesses, uh, over 120 exhibits. Wow. Uh, there was demonstrative evidence that wasn't uh, documented in the pictures from the crime scene that the judge allowed in over my objection because we didn't know where this jack, this police jacket that all of a sudden just popped up in his car that wasn't mentioned in the uh, crime scene unit report. We didn't know where this jacket came from. There were pictures taken eight months after the incident that she allowed in. I, I, I mean, it was just stuff that <laughs> you just had to step back and laugh to keep your, your, your composure. And at one point, I have to admit, Ms. Vivian, I almost lost my composure. Wow. Uh, and I'm a pretty easygoing guy, but I had to approach her in her chambers and let her know about herself and tell her, like, look, I want you to do your job and be an impartial referee. Okay, it, it's, now it's getting out of hand. Um, you know, and her tone and her demeanor towards myself and my father, I thought was just unacceptable for a judge. But we still trudged on uh, because I felt no matter what she was trying to do, I felt like we had a good jury and I felt like we had a, ju a good jury that was going to understand what we were trying to show and what the state failed to show. And at the end of the day, the jury believed us. And the jury felt like the state did not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt with regards to the aggravated assault against a public servant. Keep in mind, 95% of their case was based on this aggravated assault against a public servant. Unfortunately, and, and, and to my surprise, and I was very disappointed and still am disappointed about it, they found him guilty on the aggravated robbery. And uh, once we were able to go back and talk to the jurors, a lot of them compromised. We had a, a few, uh, I'd say about three juries, jurors on that particular panel that felt like he was not guilty of the aggravated robbery. But because of a tape that the judge allowed in a, a purported confession, which wasn't a, a confession, over my objection because he had asked for his attorney to be present and the police, the homicide detective, just disregarded that and continued on with the uh, with the statement. It was at that point in time, those particular three jurors said, well, okay, based on this tape, I felt like he was involved in something. And so 
we compromised. What was on the tape? Well, what was on the tape was my guy said that he was at the scene, but he was not the person that was outside of the car. Now, prior to going to trial, when I had filed this motion to suppress, because that's what you do uh, when there are statements that you feel like are, are violative or violative of uh, one's constitutional rights, the DA had told me, and I think this was more so of his arrogance towards the case, I'm not even going to worry about the tape. You know, I don't need the tape. Those were his exact words. But once this trial started going on and he felt it slipping, all of a sudden now he wants to bring up the tape and he wants to bring in that particular defect detective, even though that detective was not subpoenaed, wasn't on his witness list. I mean, there were things that were going on that was just kind of like, what, what's going on? And even over my objection of, hey, I knew about this guy, but this guy was not on his witness list. Prior to this trial, it was told to me by this particular DA that he wasn't going to call this witness. Judge let it in and... Did you object to that? I did. We objected to it. We had the uh, suppression hearing. Uh, I gave the judge a transcript. I paid for an independent transcriber to transcribe the two-hour uh, wow. recorded statement. Spent good money on it. This lady did a very good job. Got it. I'd say she was about 98 percent accurate. The state did not bother to get their own transcription of this, this statement. So the only evidence that the judge had to look at was my memo. The state did not have a memo. My transcription of the tape and the tape itself. And listening to all that, even though my guy, after they asked him, do you understand your legal rights? And my guy says, yeah, but I need my lawyer to come talk for me. She still found that he waived his right to counsel and allowed that tape to come in. And that tape was very damaging, which I had informed my client that if this tape were to come in, it could be very damaging. But I didn't think it would be damaging with regards to the aggravated robbery, knowing that there was no evidence to support any taking of any items, anything. How did it play in when he said that I was there, but I didn't do it? Because the police officer originally said it was only one person and that person was rummaging through his vehicle, his, off, you know, his private vehicle, and that person ran to a vehicle and got in the driver's seat, implying right. that there's only one person. Well, no, what the police officer actually said was he said that there was a second person in this car, a black person. He, he loves to throw around, and this is a black police officer, so I don't want to get the viewers all upset with this new Tiger Woods thing going on. But he said that he could tell it was a it was a black person but he couldn't tell whether it was a male or female now he again he's he can see through this car that has extremely dark tint I, I don't know if he had some type of superpowers or what but so that puts a second person there at the scene but his excuse for not trying to id a second person because there were two names given on this tip his thing was well i know i couldn't see the second person so i'm not even going to try and he testified to that but without having seen my guy just saying a black male, he knew for sure this was the guy that was rummaging through his trunk. But my guy on the tape said that, hey, I wasn't the guy that was outside on, on this trunk, in this trunk. I, I was in the passenger seat the entire time. By the time this guy came out, we were already rolling out. And then he just started shooting. We didn't know who this cat was, you know, so. The tape was very damaging, to say the least, and, and, and those jurors, um, while we were talking in front of the DAs, that's what they said, and then once we were leaving, you know, they even confessed even more. It was like, you know, look, it was kind of one of those things where we had a lot of people like, well, he had to be guilty of something. And that's the mindset of a lot of people. Well, he may not have done this, but he was doing something. And I'm not afraid to say it now that this case is over. What was he doing? Yeah, he was, he was out there while somebody was burglarizing this man's car, okay? But the state did not charge him with burglary of a motor vehicle. Right. So that's not what we were there for. And unfortunately, you know, it was kind of... And as, uh, there's also a, a part in the law, and I don't know if you got this in the jury charge, though, um, that mere presence is not... You're not did. guilty for mere presence. She did put it in? She did put it in there, but... She quickly backdoored that with the law of parties. Although you don't have the identity of the second person, but given the fact that a person is involved in a crime, 
that makes them uh, a part of the, the, the crime, regardless of whether or not we know who the other person is or not. You're guilty by association. But that's not the law. But, that, but that's not the law. I mean, you're not guilty by association. A lot of people say that, mm -hmm. but that's what the purpose of the mere presence charge. The mere presence charge is supposed to be given if it's a law of parties case. So it has to be a law of parties case first. Right. And then you get the mere presence charge saying that I was there and letting the jury know just because a person was there, th they're not guilty. They had to have made some affirmative act to want the same crime to be committed. They have to have that, they have to have participated in some way, even if it's a small way. Well, originally, and it, this is something else that I, I didn't talk about, but originally, prior to this tape coming in, we had a jury charge that did not have the law of parties. But as I said, once once the DA realized that this case was slipping and he was on, he was about to be on the losing end, we then bring up this whole tape issue. We then subpoena uh, this officer to come in and and, and testify. And, uh, well, I shouldn't say subpoena. We then call this officer to come in and testify. And, you know, now all of a sudden we get the law of parties in the jury charge. And over my objection, uh, it, it was overruled, of course. And <laughs> Wow. And it so was in. Let's talk about the fact that you don't think you got a fair trial. Let's talk about that part. Okay. And the reason, and I want to talk about it like this, specifically in your case, but... You have not had trials before all 22 felony judges, have you? No, ma'am, I have not. Uh, or, nor all 15 misdemeanor judges. No, ma'am, I have not. So you're being generous by saying it's always fair, but it generally is, uh, and I would say it generally is. However, what did you think was so unfair about uh, the trial in the 262nd Denise Bradley? Whew, I don't even know if we'll have enough time to uh, talk about the things, but I, I, I think one particular instance I can point out was when my investigator was testifying and uh, the prosecution kept asking the same question over and over and over and I kept objecting as asked and answered. He's already given the answer and the judge kept overruling it and it seemed as if she saw that the particular prosecutor was getting frustrated. You could look in his face and see him turning all red. He was getting frustrated and so then she said, okay, well, we're going to go to a recess. Now, my prosecutor was out of town, I'm sorry, my prosecutor, my investigator was out of town on another case in Amarillo. And I informed her that he was going to be out of town and possibly would not be able to be a trial at the close of the state's case. Well, instead of giving me a continuance for a day or two, she was like, well, you need to get him here. Uh, and why is he a material witness? I said, well, he's a material witness because he's, he's going to shed light on some things that the state is not shedding light on. He has been paid to investigate this case from our side and to investigate this case honestly and fairly, and we need him to come to testify. Well, it wasn't good enough for her, okay? State had the same issue of a witness not being available, uh, and he was working in Houston, but he couldn't get off. So we weren't anywhere near the close of, of court. What she decided to do was, okay, well, we'll just, we'll just continue it to the next day. We'll just, we'll just let everybody out early and just have him here early in the morning. Now, I felt that was a little unfair. That's very unfair. Um, you know, but again, like I said, my confidence was extremely high because I knew the state's case was weak and I knew they were slipping. And, uh, you know, so I, I, it really wasn't bothering me. Let me give you another anecdote on, on uh, Denise Bradley. When she was a prosecutor, I tried a capital murder against her. It was me and Randy. Uh, uh, Randy McDonald and her and uh, I forgot the other prosecutor, uh, Mia Magnus. And both of us had daughters graduating from the eighth grade. Um, she got to, a court was mysteriously closed for the afternoon for her to go watch her daughter graduate from eighth grade, mm -hmm. you know, at the Ritz School. My daughter was graduating and I didn't get to go. So, of course, I missed her fifth grade graduation and eighth grade graduation, but it's uh, it's always interesting how that happens. Right, right, and, uh, right. So she she believes in there being a an unfair system. Right, right, and and you know I think the thing that did it now I understand I'm just 30 years old and I'm a young lawyer and I know I have to pay you know pay my dues I, I get that, but her tone towards my dad who's a really easygoing person and who really wasn't. Uh, saying too much and was just kind of letting me, you know, I was lead counsel and was just kind of 
being the the legal lawyer and, and and the guy to rein me in when I felt when he felt like I was getting a little out there. Uh, it got to the point where the judge was objecting or overruling my objections and wasn't letting me finish my thought that finally he had to say something and I remember her saying, Mr. Millers, I don't need to hear from you. Enough. Carry on. And so I remember people in the courtroom like, whoa, you know, like what kind of stuff is that? And so at that point in time, once we went on a recess, I immediately went to her chambers and I told her, I said, Judge, you know, look, I, I respect the robe. I get all that. Well, why are we having this conversation? I said, because we're, we're having this conversation because I said so. And we need to have this conversation because I feel like you're not giving us a fair trial. I feel as if you're being disrespectful to us. You know, in order to get respect, you have to give respect. And we've done nothing but be respectful to you. But your demeanor towards us is unacceptable. And I definitely did not appreciate how you responded towards my father. I said, now, I'm just telling you that I don't appreciate it and I'm watching you. After that, she kind of calmed down a little bit. And I was upset. And it took everything in my power not and to you, call and, out her name. And you should have been upset. You know. And you should have been upset. And I wish the media knew that. It's just so unfortunate that in Harris County, as long as you're a Republican, you can become a judge, but you can be disrespectful. And some of the same Republican citizens, mm -hmm. when they get to court and see how disrespectful people are, how the judges are to them, they regret the fact that they don't know who the judges are. Let's, yeah. take, a, let's take a quick call. Caller, thank you for calling. Hello. I, I was wondering about uh, the client's statement. It had to do with just the, the first charge, right? Uh, the first charge and the second charge are out of the same police report, so it's just one activity. Correct. That that uh, the statement had to do with with the first charge, which, although as Miss Vivian said, they were out of the same transaction. Remember now, the only charge that we had was aggravated assault against public service for six months. For six months. So once the prosecutors, sometimes when prosecutors realize their case is weak, they'll file another charge on you because they know jurors, citizens will, will go back. Because see, the prosecutor needs to, needed to have dismissed the first case, basically, because you have to know a person as a police officer before you can assault a police officer. And remember, this guy's off, so he looks like he's off work. He's in his own private car. It's not an undercover car. How in the world, if someone is, say, for example, his client was the one rummaging through the car. He was just rummaging through a car. If someone comes out looking like a regular person like you and I, they're not going to know who you are. And if they're running from you and you're shooting at them, they're certainly not going to know who you are from a distance. So let's say it, that still would never be aggravated assault of a peace officer because you have to know the person as a peace officer. And they couldn't prove that. But the officer was angry because he wanted the, the DA's office to take the highest charges available. Burglary of a motor vehicle, which is what they should have taken, is a misdemeanor. misdemeanor. It's a, it's a misdemeanor where you go to jail for up to one year and up to a $4,000 fine. Well, the officer's like, hell, I'm a cop. I want something tough on him. So they, they, they got, they, they charged him with assault on a peace officer. But the prosecutor knew he could make that case and knew jurors are going to say, well, how, when is this person supposed to know? Even if I believe it's him, when was, were we supposed to know? S flashing a badge when someone's already running from you, because wouldn't you imagine that when a cop hollered at him or the person hollered at him, whoever he is, he ran to a car. So he's not looking back to see if somebody's pulling a badge out. So I'm just saying, that's where the problem comes in. But the statement is all about the assault on a peace officer because that's the only case that they have. But they know that if they charge another charge, people will always compromise. And so they'll get something out of you. I really don't understand the judge's reasoning allowing certain evidence where the, the statement was only concerning the assault on the officer, and what's that got to do with the con eventual uh, co um, conviction? Well, because they, she wanted the jurors to feel like birds of a feather flock together, and in his statement he's saying, I was that second passenger in the car, but I was not the person that got the, the driver. I was not the one you were coming after. And so that's like, got you. Now, even though you're supposed to believe it beyond a reasonable doubt, even if they didn't believe him, I guess they believed that he, it was really him. So, but if it was really him, then why didn't they do assault on a peace officer? I, I don't know. And the, th the thing that's problematic for me about Sam's case is he's an excellent young lawyer, and he was out, out maneuvered by an experienced prosecutor, an experienced prosecutor who's now a judge, and whose husband is a, is a po homicide detective, who's a police officer. She's going to always be biased. And the, the, the assaulted, alleged assaulted cop was a homicide, right? Yes. 
But should she have recused herself? The proper thing to do would have been to recuse herself, but I'm sure, Sam, you didn't know that until in the end. I, See, unfortunately, how would you know? I did not know that. Yeah, how would you know? Because she doesn't use, what's her last name, Bradley? No, that is her husband's name. But we don't know who the officers are. I mean, it's, like, it's not like we have a tickler system of who the officers are. Everything is real secret about the officers, so we don't know who they are. Uh, we don't know who, the, who their co-workers are. It would, it would be no way that Sam would know that. I would know that, and I've been around much longer than him. Sam said that uh, the offense report after he got it after six months or a few months was um, 100 pages. And let me tell you why it might have been 100 pages, because when an officer discharges his weapon, he has to go before the grand jury. So then he, we go into the cover your ass CYA mode. So then they have to document everything. He has to go before IAD or their own little internal investigation as to why he discharged his weapon. Did, did they have the results of a talk screen on the officer? Oh, no, they're not going to do that. was at a bar, to... wasn't it? Oh, no, they're not going to do that to a police officer. No, no, they, they, they didn't do that. A police officer, according to HPD policy, and this guy wasn't drinking. Uh, and I, I can say that with all, with confidence he wasn't drinking but a police officer when they're on duty they're not supposed to drink or else they're considered to be off duty but no they did not perform that on him they just more so as Miss Vivian said just basically just put him through the ringer as to why you dislodged your, your firearm you just were there any firearm. bullet holes in the car that was shot at and that was another thing we talked about last week yes sir there was but they never had the car they did not recover the car I don't know why they didn't recover the car but they didn't recover the car nobody your client doesn't know what happened to his car? I mean, nobody knows what happened to the car? No, no one knows. I don't know. The state definitely didn't know, so they didn't have anything. Like I said, this was a case based on... Now, remember, the client was a passenger. Right. So, and apparently, you know, if you're with somebody that gets in trouble, you're not going to turn your friend in, usually. Right. Uh, did your client have a good idea who the informant was? No. Nobody knows. I, I mean, as Ms. Vivian talked about last week, a lot of times when money is attached to a reward, all of a sudden people come out of the woodworks with, with information. You know, uh, when there's no money involved, well, people are, you know, hey, they're going about their business. But uh, I, I, I don't sometimes think he has an idea. Sometimes let me tell you something else, caller. Sometimes co-defendants will call Crime Stoppers on the other co-defendant so, so that they have been won't. Uh, the true perpetrator who hadn't, say, right. a scenario that had nothing to do with your client, that he, he wanted this case resolved, and uh, he knew somebody in the car was a Challenger, a uh, Dodge Challenger, would you say? Yeah, Charger. Charger. Uh, um, knew somebody with a Dodge Charger, uh, knew uh, the true, say, the true perpetrator also had a Dodge Charger. This case gets resolved after he informs on somebody that uh, potentially totally innocent. Right, and you know what, that very well could have been the case, but we will never know, uh, unfortunately. That's the only thing that's weird about Crime Stoppers is that you get a tip, but they never, they really do keep it anonymous. They do not right. tell the defense. Or they do not, the prosecutors probably know, but they don't tell us who it is, so you don't, you really can't challenge your accuser. And I have known of of incorrect Crime Stoppers tips. You know, girlfriends, disgruntled girlfriends, when a, when a guy might have several girlfriends or a wife. I mean, people will report things, and sometimes they report it like the news does. It's just hearsay. Right. You know, for example, in, when there's a catastrophe, the news might say 100 people got killed. Then when the facts pan out, it might have been 10 people. Right. So that it's, just, it's something like that. So people who hear people say, you know, I did this or I did that, they might assume they did something that they saw on TV, and they might have been talking about doing something else. So people will call and report on you to get that money. And sometimes there are people with evil intent, and I've even known of co-defendants who have called in on each other because it got revealed uh, in, a way, in, a, in a different kind of way. You know, yeah. before they get me, I'm gonna tell it on you. Right, right, right. And so, uh, but they, they get to be the anonymous person and they might even get the reward. Right. So that, that's not a foolproof system. That's why everything and everybody needs to be challenged. Right, right, right. Because we had a caller last week that sounded like a cop and he was like, you know, well, this, you know, he was taking everything as gospel, but we know that there's crooked cops, there's crooked anybody. I mean, you know, lawyers, doctors, judges. I thought it was a recused judge. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, look at what these judges have done. Look at the judge that's about to go do, uh, what is he about to do, 20 years in prison, a federal, oh, I mean, a yeah. judge is about to do about yeah. 20 years because he was basically selling kids to a private prison? I think the caller should 
take a trip down to Harris County Court and, and look at all the defendants that are young men and uh, people of color. Young men and people uh, of color. And let me tell you this. When a police officer gets in trouble, he wants the best lawyer money can buy. Oh, yeah. And when his children get in trouble, because they do. I've represented two different cops' kids. They want the best lawyer that money can buy. Oh, yeah. So it's always easy to point the finger when you have the badge, but we're all sinners saved by grace. We're all here, you know, based on mercy and good fortune. And things can happen to us, and if we're too good and high and mighty, it can happen to our children. Yeah, it well, happens my, all the time. My point was is the caller wasn't considering that young people of color are targeted. And, uh, I mean, the police, every shift, they're, they're required to bring somebody in, right? Uh, they will never admit that, but yes, they are. And that caller was also not considering uh, the fact that the judge had the judge's role is still to be fair and impartial, and you don't degrade uh, Mr. Millage's client. You don't talk ugly and nasty about someone like you're at a a, a rooster fight. Uh, <laughs> somebody has to be the. Sometimes we have to police the police the judges, and it's a hard job to do, uh, you know, because of that that judge and prosecutor country club. Right, right, right. So right. it's difficult. Thank you for your call. I hear the rest of the story. Thank you. All right. I, I mean, but, you know, nevertheless, we, we got past that, and uh, I was a little disappointed with it, but just to hear the jury. And another victory that we, we received in that case, and I know it may not seem like a, a victory to the, the person on the outside, but, Ms. Vivian, you can attest to this. When the prosecution tells uh, during punishment that they want your client, they tell the jury that they want your client to die in jail, and they're asking for either life or 60 years at a minimum, even on aggravated robbery, and I'm not saying that it's not a long time because 30 years is still a long time, uh, the jury came back with 30 years. And, you know, my client was thinking they were going to give him 40 or 50, and I said, no, it'll probably be somewhere between 20 and 30 years. And I felt, I felt I was correct on that. But, you know, as I told them, you know, we like to make people's lives a math problem. And it's not. These are human beings. I understand, like you said, we all sinners saved by grace, okay? But it kills me when sometimes the, the argument is that, you know, this person needs to die and, you know, you just need to throw him away and he needs to learn. And obviously he's had a, a past of crime and, you know, you just need to hammer him and send a message. Well, my response to that is, you know, and I know you're not supposed to personalize things, but this is a human being we're talking about. This ain't no dog. This, this isn't a, some type of animal that you just throw away. And I don't think that's personalizing. I think that's personalizing it to the human race. I mean, I think that's uh, personalizing what to me would be you talking about yourself. Right. But to talk about how he is a human being. Mm. And, and a young man, and 24 young man, years 24 old. 24 years old, and you're going to give him 30 years right. for something that's not even written up in a 100-page police report? Right. I mean, that is 30 crazy. 30 years, and like I explained to him, he's 24 at a minimum. He has to do 15 years before he's even to be considered for parole. And there's no guarantee that he is going to get parole. And really, the odds are a lot lower. I, I don't know what the odds are, but I read something where the odds of a, a person that uh, is up for the parole for the first time is about 35%, something of that nature. I mean, so, you know, 30 years, yeah, it was a victory because it wasn't him dying in prison or, or 60 years, but it's still a long time. But, you know, as we talked about earlier, when he, when they, uh, when they got the new case on him, or shall I say, when they when they put the aggravated robbery on him, he jumped on, and he did that only, come up in the trial at all? In the punishment, it, it came up in punishment. Of course, he brought that up in punishment. Uh, talked about how he jumped. Who did he bring on. it up through? Uh, he brought it up through the GPS guy that he jumped on, uh, Dale Coburn, who's actually a very nice guy, very nice guy, and I think he does wonderful work. And his one thing Who I is he? See, He's the guy that does all the GPS monitoring for the Harris County court system. Now, is he, who is he employed by? He's independent. But Harris County, I believe, or certain courts have a contract with him when they place those conditions on a person's bond that they have to have an ankle monitor, he gets that business. Well, his whole attitude, he's, he's a pure businessman. He just don't want anybody cutting off his braces because it's $1,800 to replace it. I can understand that. But... Uh, they, they brought that up through him, but in the punishment phase, unfortunately, my client, again, I'm not going to sit here and try to make it seem like my client's a saint, okay? Uh, I don't pick and choose my clients. Uh, I take them as they come. 
he was on he was picked up allegedly burglarizing a home okay uh, the young lady that was in this house and apparently was burglarizing a home that was of a purported drug dealer I'm gonna go in and, and, and rob take the money okay? but, but he never got in the house never got in the house because apparently this particular person the house was in a girlfriend's name it was a stash house basically Explain to my callers what a stash house is. Stash house is where you keep all your, I don't want to say all your narcotics, but more so where you keep your money. So it was a stash house for purposes of money. Other stash houses that we know about are where you keep the drugs, okay? And, and most drug dealers change their stash houses because they know that uh, law enforcement is on their tail. So and they have other to drug switch dealers. It up. And other drug dealers. And robbers. Right. Because uh, one thing that callers need, I mean, viewers need to know is that Rob, drug dealers get robbed by other guys in the street more than you or I ever get robbed. Right. I mean, right. they get robbed often. Right. So, never got in the house because apparently the girlfriend flashed the lights to let them know that somebody was in the house. So they don't get in the house. She calls the police. It was about five or six guys. Trying to get into the house. Right. In the backyard about to get right. in the house. Right. And unfortunately for my client, all this stuff was on surveillance. This house had a surveillance camera. Because it's a stash house. It's a stash house. So you need to see what's going on. So they had masks on. You can't tell who's who, okay? You don't know who's who or what's going on. Well, she calls the police. The guys get in the car. They take off. You know, the police get behind them, you know, turn on the lights. So the guys park the car. Everybody bails out running. And when they bail out, one cop runs one way. The driver of the police car runs to the right. Then the passenger runs to the left after some guys that ran to the left. Well, whoever was the driver of that particular car sees a police officer running. He floors the car and hits this police officer, okay? The one police officer that took off that way sees his partner hit. He comes back, checks on his partner, and then reassumes his route, okay? In so the, the partner's not hurt bad? No, the partner's not hurt at all. He reassumes his route, and somehow there's a shootout, okay? Unfortunately, my client gets shot. He gets shot by the cop's bullet. Well, they tried to say my client uh, shot nine times at the police officer, all right? The problem was this report failed to mention that there were five people. In the that, car. That were the five people that were in the car. They only said that there were four people in the car. Two ran one way, and my guy was the only guy that ran the other way. It made it easy for them to say that he was the guy shooting. Well, that wasn't the case. Um... Nevertheless, now we have a real aggravated assault on a peace officer. So he gets charged with another aggravated assault. Now, just going back to our previous case, the prosecution wasn't worried about trying this new case because he felt like he was going to get a good sentence. Now, generally, if someone gets 30 years, that's a long time. You let it go. Right. That's a long time for a kid, especially since the plea bargain offer was 20 years. Right, so right. So you got, you, you got 30. Right. He's going to be there for... 15 to 20 years, right. maybe longer, right. and so you, you let it go. You don't use, it's, you call, call that judicial economy. You're just not going to use the court system's money again to get a sentence that, by and large, is going to run concurrent. So even if we go through another week of trial, 64 jurors are called over, 12 are selected, plus one, 13 with an alternate, and he gets convicted, Generally, it's going to just, and he say he gets another 30 years, it's going to run at the same time, right. generally. That's and the, the general rule. And the interesting thing about this case, and this is something I want to talk about briefly, of course it gets put back into 262nd, okay? Now, this happens in August. Mind you, this is when he gets arrested. He gets picked up at the latter part of August. We just got out of trial at the beginning of February. The state as well as Judge Bradley was so gun ho to try this second case. This second case was just tried in April or May. So you're talking about six months from the time that he got arrested on that charge. In Harris County, and Ms. Vivian, I know you can speak to this, most felony cases take at least a year and a half to two years to go to trial. Exactly. So again, I felt like there's something there. Why is it that you're so gun ho to try this young man when we just got out of trial in January. And you probably have 30 cases that where are people way have been older. in jail 
for two years waiting for their trial. That are way older. And, and he's gotten his 30 years. He's already gotten his 30 but years. But it's because Bill wanted to make sure he got life. And they were talking about stacking his sentences, right? They were talking about stacking the sentences. Explain and, and that, please. What that means is basically because it... It did not happen in the same transaction of facts. If a person gets 30 years, he gets a second sentence of 30 years. Once he finishes that first 30 years, he now has another 30 years that he has to do. So they just stack it on top. Whereas running concurrent... And that's really rare. Let's right. just say that. That's really rare to do that. Well, when, when they run a concurrent, you know, it just runs together and it, it ends at the same time. You know, it makes it easier on everybody. But I felt like Bill took this personal. I, I, I felt like... Quite honestly, I felt like he felt I was a little arrogant, uh, which I may have been, but I knew my case, and I knew my case better than he knew his, and, and I told him that, and I don't think he was expecting that from such a young lawyer, and keep in mind, Bill had just got promoted to major offenders, so he lost all the way around. He lost the main case he, he spent the resources on, and he got less time than what he was offering, which was 60 years, not 20. 20 was the first offer. Oh, okay. After we rejected that, it, it skyrocketed to 60. to 60. Okay, so he wanted to try that case. So he wanted to try that case, and he had even said that, you know, if he got the time that he wanted to get, he wasn't going to try the second case. And I felt like 30 years was more than enough time, but, you know, of course, he had to save face, in my opinion. Uh, and they tried the case six months after he had been arrested, and I, I didn't work that case because... I felt the need to work on the appeal of the uh, first case, and uh, unfortunately my client got convicted, and I was there for the trial. He got convicted, and I thought the public defenders for what they, for the amount of time that they had the case, the particular public defender who had this case had only had the case for approximately 40 days. Wow. And he tried the case. Wow. And he and, tried to get it reset. And he tried to get it reset, and the judge denied his reset. And uh, one of the reasons why you can get a continuance in a trial is if you have a missing witness. And they also hired me to try to work on it, too, even though they, I couldn't go to trial at the time it was set for trial. We just knew that they would get a second. Right. Uh, we, a, re, a, a reset, be, a, a motion for continuance would be granted because the police officers were wrong about how many people were in the car. The young man was stuck because he didn't want to tell who the other people were. So I started investigating, uh, I guess like a week or two before the trial, and found one of the other guys and uh, gave that to the public defender so that they could go send their investigators to look for them. I mean, we had everybody's name, but mostly were nicknames. But I, we found every, I found everything on one particular uh, passenger in that car who was involved, his address, date of birth, everything on him, and gave that to them for them to ask for continuance if they could not, if his investigator could not find him. And the judge still wouldn't grant it. And right. that's a legal reason when a young man is facing life in prison and there were other people in that car because the problem with the case was this. The young man ran, he has very poor vision and he dropped his glasses jumping out of the car. I have very poor vision, so I can relate to this. When you have poor vision, you don't generally, at nighttime, shoot at people. Especially, you just keep running and running and running in the bushes because you can't see. I mean, you can't see, so you're just trying to hide. And, and that's what the young man said he did. Mm -hmm. He said he was following the trail of somebody else that he heard running, but he couldn't see. He lost his glasses. Uh, so the public defender did a good job. They got a copy of his, his prescription. Did an they, excellent job. They got a copy of, they got an optometrist to testify about how bad that vision is and how you couldn't see at night. So you'd have to be blind, uh, kind of blind like we are to understand that. When you can't see good, you just don't, you're not the aggressor about anything because you're just passive and you're trying to get away. So I believe that he, he wasn't the shooter. It, and I, it was the wrong gun. He was arrested with his gun. Right, right. And, so, uh, and, and, and they basically, I guess the police lied about the, the other gun. Yeah, and there were a lot of things that were missing, but most, the most hurtful thing about this was most attorneys need at least 90 or so days to adequately prepare for trial. I mean, you have some attorneys like my father, like Ms. Vivian, who have been trying cases and have done hundreds of cases and can get ready in a short amount of time. But a, a, a case of that nature, the, the severity, you needed more than 43 days. And I felt like, and I remember you and I talked about this because I felt like that wasn't enough time and that would have been my main reason. But you told me, you said, but you need law behind your continuance. And, any and that's other why I created the legal reason. Right. Because I made the young man what didn't trust the public defender's office, so he wouldn't tell him the other passengers in the car. Mm -hmm. And the officer was acting like not only did he shoot at the cop, he also tried to hit the cop with the car. He couldn't do both. They were happening at the same time. 
And so I made the young man say who the other people were. Right. And right. wouldn't found one of them because he wouldn't give it to the public defender. Right. Because you, you're about to go down for something you didn't do. You were there. You almost did the burglary. And and, I, and they really were stupid. They should have run because they never got to do anything. Right. I mean, they never got to do well, anything. Well, you know, unfortunately, that's the nature of most people. They just want to run. And you're right. Don't run. Just stay there, you know, and, and that let let the chips fall where they may but when you run you only exacerbate the situation but in this particular case any other judge I do believe knowing that a case had only been in a particular attorney's hands for 43 days would have reset the case but again this just goes towards Judge Bradley in her mindset and I, I again I kept saying this case is only six months old and I know for a fact you have cases in here that are twice the age of this case why is it, what is it about this young man that makes you want to try this case fast enough? Uh, I remember when the sentence came back, Judge Bradley herself was surprised that he, you know, got found not guilty and he only got 30 years. So uh, you think she maybe took it personally? Let's take a one more call because it's getting late. Okay. Thank you for calling. You still there, caller? You still there? Guess it got good. He just wants to listen. <laughs> it got good to him. Yeah, but uh, I... You know, I I really want to hold on and say that she didn't take it personal, but her actions suggest otherwise. Her actions suggest that she did take it personal. Uh, I, I definitely know the prosecutor took it personal. I don't care what he says. I see him now and we speak, but I know he took that personal. Because generally when you get promoted to uh, a, a higher division like major offenders, you're not going to keep no little old case down in the regular felony court. So it was personal to him. Uh, he could Maybe eaten. he knew the police officers. I, I, I don't know. But uh, just to wrap this up, they go through trial. Uh, the public defenders do as good as they can, do as good as anyone can with only having the case for 43 days. The guy gets convicted, and the jury comes back and gives him 68, six, eight years. Wow. That's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. And, of course, the judge didn't even consider stacking it. That was the, the nicest thing she did throughout the trial, and uh, she ran it concurrent. So... Uh, but still, that means he now has to be in jail for 30 years before right. he's eligible to even talk to anybody about parole. So he right. will be 54 years old when he's only 24 right. before he can even talk to the parole board. And like Sam said, most people are set off on their first parole, generally on aggravated offenses. And I don't know if this is the same rule, but it used to be they do 85%. I don't you know. know. That just it all just depends <laughs> on how much how much space they have in the prison. Yeah, I, I don't know, but my heart really goes out to it and, and you know, I, I take things with my clients. My my slogan is, you know, it's not just business to me, I take it personal because this young man is from the same area of town I'm from. We both from Greenspoint. And I'm proud to say that. And unfortunately, uh I see a lot of things. I, I don't condone a lot of things that people from my area do. I you know, I was fortunate to have both my folks, my dad. Uh, but at the same point in time, I see how easy it is because I've been a victim of just being that black male, just standing in the apartment. It's one of the reasons why I became an attorney because I was wrongfully accused of something. I'm just standing in my apartment uh, talking outside to a buddy of mine, and I'm suggested to be a drug dealer. And anybody that knows me knows that's the furthest thing from me. I'm an athlete. Right. Uh, so... You know, to see us get treated like that, and, and that's what really burned me up about the first case that I was on, that out of the three statements that this officer gave, the only description that he could give was a black male. So that could have been you. It could have been me, and that's what I told him. I said, officer, you're a suspect. My father's a suspect. I'm a suspect. This, this lady's son in the jury box, he's a suspect. You know, this is Houston. This isn't uh, uh, Cold Springs, Texas or anything. This is Houston. We have one of the highest African-American percentages in the country. You know, so it was disappointing to see that, and I just felt like it was unfair. But again, you know, um, like the jury said, you know, he may not have been guilty of that, but he was guilty of something, and they now, compromised. Have you have you thought of ways that you could keep the jury focused on what their mission is in the future? Because, you, you know, these type of trials are learning experiences. They are. And so, you know, have you... The two points that I hope that you, and I know you are, are, are thinking about, would be whenever they split the cases up, 
Mm -hmm. You got to be prepared on voir dire for uh, compromising. Right. You got to deal with that. And I know you know that now. That right, right. Now that I know that, and that's something I definitely and see, did and not And that's talk why about. the experience of right. lawyers matters. Right. Because I've had that happen, and that, and that always gets you. Mm -hmm. And that's why people get convicted in federal court, because they always charge them with multiple counts. And so people are so confused, and they don't care. They're going to convict them of something. Right. You know, if they right. said if the government has 10 counts, then you he must have done be, something. He's got to done something. Yeah, so they don't even give it any thought, but really, it's just, it's game. It's just right. really just. Right. A ploy to always win. Right. And when the government does that, when they, the state does it too. Uh, so you should be, you should be really aware of the compromise issue. Right. And and it, and definitely that's something that I, I took into consideration after the fact. And like I say, hindsight is twenty twenty. But the thing that I also took from it is to continue to fight. Right. Fight, fight, fight. And like I told Bill, I'm not down here to make friends. Right. These people ain't paying me good money to make friends. Right. And if if I'm going to be ostracized because I fight for my clients and I, I believe in my case, then so be it. You know, and I got enough friends. You do, and luckily you practice with your father. Right. For me, as a, as a black female fighting the good fight down there, it's lonely. Oh, it is. It's because tough. Because I, I know you can imagine how lonely it is for it's me. It's tough. Because most people don't fight, and if you do fight, they're not going to be your friend. Right. Because the prosecutors, even though I'm an ex-prosecutor, you know, only the ones who were prosecutors with me and older, like Denise Bradley, I was a prosecutor with her. Mm -hmm. Mike Anderson, who's the DA. I mean, you know, we have a healthy respect for each other. Uh, but the younger ones, oh, she's a fighter, so they don't like me. You right. know, and the and I can't really deal with lawyers who don't fight. But a lot of lawyers will call me in to try to fight their battles. But and I did it for many years. I'm stopping now because I've just gotten too old for it. <laughs> I mean, you we get paid for this stress. Not old, seasoned. I've got too seasoned. Too seasoned for it. For it. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I'm sure your father's the same way. Yeah, he he's he's an older I mean, version to, of me. He's he's just a little bit more laid back. But uh, that's that's just me. I, I'm gonna continue to fight. I'm gonna fight, and uh, you know whatever the ramifications may be, so be it. So long as I get a fair trial and you respect what we're doing. Well, we have two minutes left. Um, wrap it up however you'd like to wrap it up, but are, or do you have any words of wisdom as to how we as lawyers and citizens can make sure that we get judges who are fair and impartial? It's so important that we all come out here and vote. I, I, I can't say it enough. After this trial, elections, local elections are more important than our national elections in Harris County, in my opinion. I'm glad President Obama got elected, I voted for him, but we really need more people to pay attention and vote locally because the vote affects who gets on this bench. A lot of people run unopposed and we just voting for them and we don't know, you know, so definitely get out there and vote. And I would advise people to go in and, and, and come watch some trials. Right. Watch the trial so you can see what's going on for yourself. Don't just let the news tell you, watch some trials. Because the news is wrong. Right. And a lot of times what you need to do is most people in Harris County have had a friend, family member, family member's friend, a child in trouble. Go to, make that your opportunity to go see how inefficient the courts are run. And they could be run better, but you have to vote. You have to vote people out. You have to vote people in. You have to not pay attention to R and D, Republican or Democrat, right, right, on right, these right. judicial elections because it's not giving you what you want. Right. And, and also respond to jury duty too. Come you need on to come. Yeah, you need come to come to jury there. duty. Come on it's, and, and, it's very and be important. fair and impartial. Lawyers don't mind if their clients get convicted and it's a fair trial. Right. Because a lot of times only about 5% of all cases that are filed go to trial. Right. 5%. So that tells you all the rest of them are plea bargaining. People are taking the time or whatever. If it's five, if they go to trial there's an issue. Like the issue in his case might have been identity and also punishment. You know, sometimes when people are not guilty, they'll still take two years if, they're scared, of, if they're scared of 60 years. Right. You know, but the issue is you need to be fair and impartial in guilt innocence, and if there's a punishment, you need to be fair and impartial. Correct. Uh, I'm getting the signal to wrap it up. Uh, hopefully, we've enlightened you tonight by t uh, taking a case study of how one 24-year-old's life has changed from to now a 30-year prison sentence and a 68-year prison sentence, and he will be 54 before he's eligible for parole on a, on a case that started with a burglary that didn't happen, two burglaries really that didn't happen, uh, he's doing 68 years. I mean, 50, I mean, he's doing 68 years, basically, and he has to wait until he's 54. Kids, pay attention to what you're doing. It's not worth it. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King, and I can't wait to see you next week. If you have a story you want to tell, don't forget to look me up. 
uh, on the internet. The credits will show my name, my email address, and my phone number. Remember, I want to tell your story. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in again. Tonight we have something really good. A hot topic in the news this week. He's been charged with crime. This is a show where I try to educate.